you still need microbio, but I did biology for science majors one and two, and I just completed calc spring semester. Nice. Um, I, I'm guessing the gen ed requirements are still the same. So you need like a full year of calc, right? So you still have the fall semester to go. And it, yeah, you have two science majors. Yeah, and microbio. Is microbio optional? Do you have, uh, is there a different, uh, do you have other forms of micro, like micro, micro level biology as a choice? Like microbiology, biochemistry, um, maybe even a separate molecular, molecular biology course as options, or do you have to take micro? Micro is very essential for, for sure, actually. In pharmacological stuff, uh, you're you're probably going to use a lot of those. But I, I would say like a discipline like molecular biology as a general general thing. Molecular, uh, micro, it covers a lot of the concepts in microbiology that might be very essential, depending on how you're going to apply pharmacological stuff. For your pharmacy school programs, they want micro. Okay, yeah. Because micro deals with a lot of, like, not not just the you know microorganisms themselves, but um, sometimes you might bridge into how you manipulate them, like how they're used manipulatively. Um, usually, back in my you know back, back up like a decade or two, the one of the dividing lines between microbiology and molecular biology is molecular bi biology tends to involve a lot of perspectives of how to manipulate things and it often overlaps with microbiology because the things you manipulate tends to be um dealing with organisms like that like e coli and etc but yeah i can definitely see that in, in any form micro and molecular maybe kind of in my opinion bias very bias micro and molecular are the parts where it becomes very interesting i think those are the two classes that will eventually become very interesting for anyone who's pursuing something that deals with medicine in general um micro molecular genetics and Sometimes organic chemistry, if you're really into that, organic chemistry, but biochemistry is a, is a soft bridge. So oftentimes it's biochemistry as opposed to organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is when you're going, deciding if you want to go into synthesis, right? Synthesis or far from pharmacy. I still need a lit class and a public speaking class for those, for those prerequisites. Oh, the gen ed requirements. Yeah. I actually took British literature my literature class requirement interesting that they uh, they require public speaking class i think we had a public speaking class requirement but that was offset because i was already giving a presentation we had like a presentation class or something where you gave seminars and speeches uh literature i definitely took uh classic british literature um, it was one of the most memorable things. I think my gen ed requirements, it, it's underrated. Later in life, when you kind of pull on your general education requirements quite, quite often. Like I still talk about music theory and music history to this day. Uh, psychology was one of my electives as well. My gen ed electives. Sociology was also one of my gen ed requirements. Then I had a uh, classic British literature. <laughs> oh, Brit Lit is what you're requiring? I think it's wonderful. Like Brit Lit is wonderful. Yeah. And then I took Spanish for like language requirement. As well. uh, I also took logical systems. There was a elective on logical systems. So that's the stuff that, you know, when you think about the opposite of philosophy 
where like a equals b if a is like b and if b is greater than c is a greater than c kind of thing logical systems and then i took another course on empire building modern empire building <laughs> i think gen ed requirements are uh, underrated but i can definitely understand when i was younger i couldn't anticipate how relevant they are now however if i was young again i probably still think the same things like yeah gen ed requirements are less focused but it's hard to argue with my position now how rich and important they are to inspiring me later it's pretty underrated you like writing so i think it's my strong suit like school wise oh okay okay um i don't um i don't know how much writing pharmacy school requires uh, certainly though writing is definitely something that is an edge if you're excellent at writing that's a wonderful skill uh right next to communication speaking skills so definitely definitely not knocking do not knock on underplay writing and speaking you can be very very intelligent and incredibly incredibly uh, well specialized however in the end right you live among human beings you live among colleagues and whatnot and a strong foundation in writing and speaking is almost unquestionably foundational to one's professional career. I mean, to this day, most of us individuals that have great writing and communication skills, they're usually not the people that you hear about when they're successful, right? The successful people that can write and talk, they speak and write in ways that doesn't draw inappropriate inappropriate consequences so to speak i'm being a little nebulous about this but generally speaking it is very very startling almost a novelty nowadays that individuals who write very well and individuals who communicate very well are those people that you don't see very often because ironically they are very unrelatable if you know what i mean like being exceptional at writing and speaking is something of a novelty uh at this point it's not really sufficient it's not necessary to be on the internet right like if you spend most of your time on the internet it's really not necessary however when you're not on the internet you don't hear those people because those people are the ones that are writing and speaking when they have to it's pretty eye-opening i'm sure you'll probably come to develop this in the future if you continue to pursue refining your writing skills and your speaking skills that there are definitely two worlds out there one of colloquial speak and writing which you must adapt and be able to accommodate and another world where you have your eccentricities your esoteric writing systems and your proper speaking mannerisms and whatnot and i'm trying to kind of sort of illustrate this a little bit uh i would not speak in this type of uh, I, I don't use this type of speech too often uh, while I'm streaming. It would make it sound perhaps pompous, disingenuous. Like a, a lot of times it's due, due to xenophobia. Like when someone is speaking in a different type of diction, it can come off as dubious, disingenuous, dodgy, maybe overly complicated, you know, political, very business oriented, or maybe overly formal. Um, oftentimes that boils down to an emotion of not feeling empathy or compassion. So you'll probably not have me, you'll probably not hear me speak like that most of the time because it can be off-putting to individuals. 
we st we stick with like words like slap fire and um mansplaining <laughs> and should i think slang and less formal makes people more comfortable yeah hence the casualness right casual right what's the what's the what's the opposite of formal casual or what's contrast with formal casual and if there's anything that hits differently is people who learn japanese if you know what i mean of all the times to bring up the contrast and appropriateness between formal speak and casual speak it would definitely be people who are learning japanese <laughs> In English is a little harder to appreciate, largely because there's really no tense tension. Like there's no actual mechanic or tension around it. It's deal with diction. Um, diction uh, dictates a lot of the formalities in English, so you can legitimately substitute your entire regular vocabulary for a different diction in order to sound formal, as opposed to learning it as a obligatory thing like it would be so interesting though i wonder how english-speaking countries right english-speaking countries would change if they approached japanese i, I don't think it would even fly really approach uh, approach english like japanese where the kids are taught diction changes between formal english and Casual English, like um, yesterday, for example, or maybe two days ago, I was demonstrating the phrase um, sufficient, sufficient, right? Sufficient, but not necessary. I think oftentimes this phrase, this phrasing is very important. However, when you're speaking colloquially about like advice and results and stuff, usually they're kind of expressing this, only it's not quite it, right? It's more indicative, like, um, you need this, you need this, right? But it's not qualified whether or do they mean it's sufficient? Or is it obligatory? There, there, yeah, you know, it, the list goes on. And generally speaking, don't. <laughs> you can flex a little bit upward. Uh, you can use words like, oh, you know, that's intriguing. You've piqued my interest. I'll place that into consideration or something like that. Or instead, you can trade it off for phrases like, Oh, I like that idea. I'll think about it. Sometimes, though, there are situations where I think um, you can read between the lines where someone would use particular vocabulary, but not quite necessarily understand how to contextualize its appropriateness. So here's an example. When someone goes up and say, oh yeah, that's suboptimal. Like, okay. Proceed. Proceed to explain how it's suboptimal. However, instead, they go around and they end the statement like that. It's like, oh, that's suboptimal. I'm like, I, I'm, I, okay. Like, I'm not sure if you're appropriately using that word. You have to qualify what suboptimal is. It's not like a word you throw out like, this is good. Like, okay, that's fine. You can say like, this is good. This is bad. That sounds like a feeling. That's great. But when you go up to someone and say, that's suboptimal. Now you're entering in appropriateness. So in expectation, you're going to have to explain how it's suboptimal. So if you stick to casual and colloquial speak, it gives you that air like, oh, you don't need to explain, explain any further. It's, it's acceptable accept what it is start getting technical and then someone you know someone comes up they speak and they try to be technical with you 
and then you just happen to be someone who's very technical but choose to be appro approachable then um the person will become defensive it would be like things like someone say okay well this is the most efficient way of integrating x y and z and then immediately i'm like oh yeah this guy's very technical right you trust them they're very technical so let's get technical and then two sentences later they're like bro 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 I, I don't don't take it so seriously i'm like oh okay well that's type of my uh type of interaction a lot of times when it comes to getting a writing and speaking down when you invite formal speak and business speak sometimes it's not quite clear at least to me that this person understands the words that they are using in my opinion so being a good writer and speaker is fantastic it's an asset especially for interviews and jobs and whatnot it's a different world out there a world that most people don't see on the internet you don't see it very often it's kind of the boring side of things people aren't interested in that in the internet on the internet although i do beg to differ somewhere right there are some places where you have these people speak like it's kind of like watching c-span i don't know if you're in the united states uh kamiya but it's kind of like sitting there watching c-span even i wouldn't sit there and watch c-span you know where like the ha house of representatives and the senators like go over nitty gritty over like the all the legislation bills like i can't that's that's beyond that's even beyond me that's too technical <laughs> I, I don't know if you ha oh you're in the united states have you ever tuned into c-span where it, there are people every day like they sit they go there and they discuss the technicalities of the bills like that is even far too technical for me and that's a different world that is definitely a different world like a minute before you lose interest <laughs> yeah I applaud the policymakers out there. I, I, I'm not built for that. I am definitely not built for policymaking. Uh, Tanaka, Tanaka san this. Wait. Oh. Uh. Yoro, oh, Yoroshiku. Uh, looking forward to working with you. Oh, I'm looking forward to working with you. Oh, Anaka Ken san. Shukudai wa itsu mo takusan arimasu ka? Someone has to do it. <laughs> yeah, that is not me. That's kind of how I try to stay grateful to, to most things. Uh, I come around thinking like, I know nothing about this. I'm grateful that someone else knows something about this and i think that's a very reasonable perspective when it comes to like a scholarly acceptance like yeah i can't do it i have to be grateful that someone else is doing it right man imagine every single day that is like you know Maybe five days out of the seven days, you walk in and that's what you do. I, I, I can 
see myself if I have to do it maybe there's a way but it's so far off that I can't even begin to approach it right now I always I always wonder if I, I wanted to go up to a policymaker and ask them do you do you like to do this or like I, it's hard for me to imagine someone like yes this is my lifeblood I always wanted to argue and debate about policy um or like a third of my life. <laughs> That's off to all those people. That's off to those people. I'd be terrified answering media because you know people will always disagree. Yeah. It's a responsibility that I can't uh, assume myself. It, it's not a cowardly thing. I think it's a, it's more of a humility thing. Maybe the money supplements that anguish. <sighs> I hope so. For for the benefit of the governing body, I hope money continues to supplement people to do that job because we need governing bodies, right? In order to create order. Um, I'm grateful that there are people who can be motivated by money supplements where I can choose to do something like this where I'm not motivated by money supplements. So it's kind of like an interesting privilege, right? Um, I get the privilege of doing something that it that I don't have to predicate on money supplements in order to complement a job that I have to do or maybe somehow roped into doing for a bigger purpose or like I'm not saying it's a better purpose or a worse purpose, but it is a bigger purpose, right? A governing and policy has many ripple effects to things. While they do that, I hope that money supplements continue to be a reasonable encouragement for them to continue to do that. For myself, I don't want to end up being like, oh yeah, People don't want to, money is not good enough anymore. So who's going to do it? Like, it's not me. <laughs> so thank you. All right. Sometimes we uh, get too caught up in what motivates people, but we also got to remember what they're doing, right? What they're doing in order to motivate themselves. So honestly, I actually think money, if money is a solution, it's awfully a simple solution compared to something like solving depression, starting a family, having closure when you die, you know, uh, being able to be at home with your kids while also maintaining actions that will ripple through millions of people's lives. That is if money can solve those problems then heck continue doing the money thing <clears throat> i think while people generalize a lot about the money su supplements i also think that we got to embrace human condition if money is a solution it is most certainly a very simple solution it would be great if it were true some people sometimes believe that is the solution. And yet we still have problems beyond money. Like feeling appreciated, feeling like you have a purpose in life. Those nebulous things <clears throat> don't get solved very often. <clears throat> Mycology and general study of medicine is a reason why I wanted to become a pharmacist. I see. <clears throat> Most people assume it's money, but I see the money as just a benefit to something you're interested in. Yes, it's icing on the cake. Money is a powerful solution, though. Yeah, and I think it's a simple one. And simple is useful. It's very pragmatic, right? 
Um, I wish there were even more powerful solutions, in my opinion. So, like, uh, when I see a politician, right? I would love to see the politician not only get money, but get a sense of well-being, a sense of positivity as a politician. What can that do to a politician? It can make a politician very positive, right? Unfortunately, money, in my opinion, has it, it's a bottom line. It's a powerful solution because it's a bottom line. But I wish even more for people, right? I don't want someone to work and they say, they come to me and say, well, at least like it puts food on the table. It's like, man, I, I would love for you to say it not only puts food on the table, it's extra because the thing you're doing is the thing you love to do. That would be like utopia, right? It's it's like the you, money is a powerful solution, but having that other phrase requires an even more powerful solution. And there isn't much of that going around. People don't get the jobs they want. They don't want to do things where money is not the primary motivation. Right? Imagine what it's like if you go into a doctor's office and a doctor's, that doctor is smiling because they're not just doing it in order out of obligation or, and that's, you know, that's kind of idolizing world, but that's kind of what I love when I see someone who's doing a job and they're just brimming with. Uh, they're glowing. They're practically glowing, right? And I see that in content creators until I don't. You can see the, you know, the, the, the startling difference between someone who's was lucky enough to have a position where they're not motivated by just money, but the money is extra. Mr. Beast, that's off to him, right? When you have a more powerful solution that also includes a powerful solution like money, you get an unbreachable, uncompetitive. There's no one can compete with the someone who has a solution that includes money and more, right? Not only do they l get money, the powerful solution, they also get more beyond that money and those people are unattainable it's like it's such a rare case it's to the point where when you watch them and you watch what they do it almost blindingly radiates back to you it almost dwarfs how not so powerful money is it's still really powerful as a bottom line but man people who have both money and something else they're practically glowing it's it's like it's so palpable <laughs> and that's kind of when i think about it like in a utopian world and obviously utopia is a idealistic theoretical con concept but that's kind of it if i had to imagine a world that's kind of what i would think yeah it's a rare breed of person Right? It deals with luck. All the things just fall into place. This person not only can make tons of money, they don't even think the money is all that important because the solution to their lives and their ambitions dwarfs out money. That's nearly impossible, right? Like it almost feels impossible to people, to people's conception that it, it's not about the money and yet money pours into them right that that's so cool and i and i kind of think of mr beast as that in the content world you just see it like when he just in interviews and stuff when he describes his work style it's insane like you know it, he works really really hard but he has more than money like there's something else that's propelling him it's it's not even close. It makes money look like chump change.
Not only that, his content makes money questionably weak. You know, it trivializes the money. And that is like an incredible flex, in my opinion. That is that is like the in most insane flex. When someone can make money feel like it's not solving problems. Like, like money is not what's capping this person. That's crazy. It's like, uh, it feels like, oh yeah, this is the most powerful weapon in the world. And suddenly you come across someone who has something more powerful than the most powerful weapon in the world. <laughs> Uh, unicorns. Unicorns. There's something magical about that. It's not to say that they don't exist. Duolingo stream slowly turning into a philosophy stream. This is how it goes. Kamiya. This is how it goes. I, I want, um, that's, that's usually, um, the whole point of it, right? You want to feel comfortable learn something wouldn't be worth if it's just a duolingo stream would it right making someone feel comfortable in their own skin or keeping them occupied or leaving an imprint on their memory that's the most valuable thing one can have not some uh you know derivative pragmatic you got plenty of those like just go look at a duolingo speed run or something <laughs> and good company good company um yeah good company let's see so uh shu uh shukudai shukudai wa itsumo taksan arimasu ka do you always have a homework? Mm hmm I hope that in college there are professors and stuff that engages you similarly. I can't express how much of my mannerisms. I still haven't gone back. I I've gone I've met with him a couple times in my life but i still haven't gone back to really pay my respects to the um, it all really changed in college and um it takes like one person in a person's life to really shift and send them down a path that they would not have otherwise realized and honestly where i started was in college things really went sideways upside down all over the place and landed in a place that i couldn't possibly imagine so this thing all these things i'm talking about and all my perspective was started it all was cultivated when i went to college it wasn't even about the biochemistry but how the biochemistry was approached i took that person that inspiration and i hope you continue to find that um i think college and university the hidden the hidden like extra value you get is often through the interaction and understanding of the people that are doing it uh the context themselves like the content itself may change and ebb and flow but the experiences you get from being around people and that stuff is almost inconceivable inconceivably priceless you have an english professor has who has really been there for you since your first semester? Ah, that's so sweet. I still go back to her personally, and my bio too. Professor is also like that. Ah, yeah. See, they have a genuine love for helping students. Yeah, you gotta know how to pick the. Here, here's the thing, right? Uh, it's a, it's a feedback loop. If there are, and I still believe there are plenty of those people out there. When a student or like someone. It, it's often your parents, right? When they are able to pass forth that same type of concern, you yourself become more hyper aware and be able to intuit seeing those people, 
And at some point, you end up becoming one of those people. So um, that's why I love when I hear people say, oh, yeah, you know what? And then this person can't stop talking about another person. And that is some person that is directly affecting their life, right? Eventually, <clears throat> that impressionable person is going to be able to pick out and understand how to identify these people. And they themselves will learn and they will become those people. And it's an investment forward. So you will probably eventually acquire all those things that those caring professors are associating with you. And that, in my opinion, is why formal education still has a place. The only downside, the harsh reality right now is that because of social pressure and societal things and shifting and politics and whatnot, not everyone gets that opportunity. It's, it's so much rarer these days than it was before. Because everything's like parasocial. Most, most things are parasocial now where people decide who they want to relate to, but that person that they're relating to does not is not aware of the existence of the other person. So there's um, the social norm no longer is a direct interaction or accessibility to a person that can offer guidance. It's usually at arm's length. So now most people are presuming and assuming what this person behaves and want to speak like. So it's a projection, projection of their depiction of this person. And we know that on the internet, the person you're having a parasocial relationship with, it's not all there. You don't get to see the other parts of their lives and you can't ask them. Oftentimes you don't have the opportunity to ask them about how they would um, react or so the person that's having the parasocial relationship guess what they would do like things like oh yeah you know there's no way my favorite hero this poly hyper polyglot would think duolingo is worth their time like well you would you wouldn't know did you ask them and then suddenly like they would it, maybe by chance they would do a review of duolingo but it's a it's a snippet. It's a snapshot of what they would think. Did you ask him, how would you make Duolingo work? You, you didn't ask them because it, they don't care about it. The idea is most people now are getting a projection of a limited frame of someone who might be incredibly influential and very, very possibly super potentially super helpful but that potential is only as great as the feedback or the ability to get advice from that person most advice are indirect on the internet you're trying your best to point that out so if you have a whole generation of people who rely on their intuitions of which they don't have any yet because they didn't go into an environment in which you can pick them out so like for you, you have an English professor and a bio two professor that will give you a, an example that will influence your way of picking out people in the future. So these people have left an imprint. So when you go on YouTube, those characteristics, you might be able to use that experience and characteristics to pick out appropriate people, even in an indirect way. There are kids who grow up with minimal contact and feedback so everything they get almost a large majority of the things they get is a hustle presented indirectly there's no interaction there's no feedback the only feedback they get is whatever they decide to do so if it doesn't work it's obviously not their fault is whatever the person who doesn't even know they exist is fault Right. So there's still a place, in my opinion, for formal education because you get that opportunity. And nowadays, whenever I hear someone go off to college, 
my first recommendation is hey go and talk to your professors your professors may change your life right it's an opportunity that most people don't have anymore um also like uh learning a foreign language if you get to talk to a japanese person go for it it's an opportunity you don't get very often anymore so that's kind of the crazy thing at the intersection of language learning and you use my uh, rate my professor when choosing so it helps picking a good one yeah 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 before it used to be like kind of a joke uh, what i mean is like people may get mixed uh results from rate my professor but now that people don't even bother doing that anymore right don't bother doing that it's up to the people who self-select themselves who are willing to do that so ironically i found that stuff like rate my professor has become a place where you have to be really you have to really care about that kind of thing to even do it in the first place so nowadays it's ironic a little bit but it became less and less of a like a you know the aggregate the popular aggregate scoring kind of deal i think in my opinion this is a case study obviously uh, rate my professor is one of the few cases that it didn't go that way where like uh, a rating database kind of went down to poop shoe like yelp reviews for example <laughs> sorry yelp but i'm sure they understand um it's hard to deny sometimes when something becomes rapidly popular and then they constantly encourage viewer engagement like user engagement versus quality pre-selection like heavily incentivized reviews then yelp Things like Yelp and stuff can be weaponized, right? So it didn't go that way. At least my impression of Rate My Professor. I was in the earlier days. I was well in the earlier days. I, it was right before I started like TAing that my, Rate My Professor has become a thing. So it's been a while. <clears throat> yeah, your English professor introduced me to a Brit Lit professor because I asked her if she had any recommendations on who I should exactly that is exactly what i mean exactly your philosophy professor i took a few semesters back has a really low score but i read the reviews and it's because he wasn't afraid to express his opinion which probably obviously didn't agree with yeah it was so nice and a great teacher well there you go right you're able to take the information and synthesize it sometimes that, that's just not the social norm right now right that's not the social norm it's whoever echoes louder it, it cuts the effort right you don't need to make too much effort if you go with where the echo is loudest like for me um if i obeyed the loudest echo right now I would probably be screaming bruh every other sentence probably trying to sell myself as the best gamer in something it could be any video game it might be a video game no one's heard of but as long as i'm the best in and um i need to convince people that i'm the goat and also um as a language learner i sh i should be streaming something like uh I should be doing Aki sessions and dual wielding Pimsler, Pimsler, and uh, making sure that I completely champion one one skill over and over again, <laughs> and maybe drill pitch accent. That's that's probably something worth a, a few clicks in optimization. I've hit a lot of buzzwords. All those buzzwords came came up multiple times uh, I'm not saying they're not important obviously but they don't mar me like I I'll get to them when I get to them right and it's pretty neat that you uh, managed to meet a great professor despite maybe unpopular you have an unpopular opinion right I have an un unpopular opinion a lot of times so, is there room for a philosophy talk while learning Duolingo? 
uh, learning Japanese while using Duolingo? Absolutely. Unpopular opinion, though. <laughs> Uh, Shumon, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, and I and you just revealed that you had a philosophy class. Very nice. I didn't get a chance to um, uh, take an elective in philosophy. Max credits, that is. Like when I was in college, you could. You could take more classes, but you would have to pay for them, right? So if you max out your classes, you don't get a chance to take more. Like I, Kawaii blouse o k i m a s I took sociology because I wanted to know about sociology, and I took psychology and logical systems, right? Those are the three, but I didn't take philosophy. Those were the those would be the four. Um, my philosophy came from being a hobbyist. Being a hobbyist, so I wanted to take like, like a, a, st a statistical approach, sociology, and then I wanted the psychology, obviously, and then I like logical systems because it helps with logic, right? Like the hypothesis testing and methodology testing and whatnot. And then I wanted philosophy, but we didn't quite get to philosophy as a requirement. It was too many overlaps of, of interest. You are also in world religion class. Interesting. What what do you cover in that one? Actually, kawaii blouse o kimasu. Kawaii blouse o su. U u da u su. Yes. Blouse. Kawaii blouse o kimasu. Ashita wa kareshi to eiga kan ni ikimasu. Yoku eiga kan de popcorn o tabemasu. Demo ashita wa tabemasen. Tomorrow you will eat a, a little popcorn. I didn't hear this before. Or maybe a lot of popcorn. Right. Yoku, Yega Khan, Yega Khan, e Papu Khan, Papu Khan. Oh, that he didn't say that much. Demo ashita wa tabemasen. Although, oh, they're not gonna eat any tomorrow. Fair enough. <clears throat> Why not? Aoi kutsu. So far, is about just the uniqueness of each religion. I see. So you're doing the co contrasting, but also how common each belief is not as unique as people might think. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So comparing and contrasting. Nice, nice. Did you happen to touch on、uh, Shintoism yet? Or you know, to integrate your interests with Japanese, Japanese learning, Shintoism. Maybe even go into like Taoist Confucianism. And the current state, like the post-communist、um, type, like the agnostic or the atheist atheism, as well. Next week is Shinto. Ooh. So did you go?、Um, I I imagine before you hit Shintoism, you already went like Taoist, Confucianism, and Buddhism, because、uh, Shinto is kind of like a, a mix and match. It's a really interesting, like. A mixed bag, so you can definitely do some very interesting comparing and contrasting between Shinto Shintoism with like Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism. Right now, it's Buddhism, Jainism, interesting, and Hinduism. Okay, okay, interesting. I I imagine、um, Shintoism is gonna be a segue into. A lot of those, especially Buddhism. Buddhism is a good segue into Shintoism.、Um, typically, you also sprinkle sprinkle in some Taoism and Confucianism, or like historics historics of how Shintoism came to be. But Buddhism is a big one, for sure. Aoi kutsu. 
Uh, this is from my high school. I didn't take a, I didn't take a college elective on religion, but in high school we were responsible for that, for the different uh, regional, at least like uh, the macro religions, much like language, right? The macro religions. Aoikutsu. Uh, most of the stuff that I learned about Shintoism was largely not high school dependent, just my interest in Japanese. Next week is Shinto, Confucianism, and another one. Yeah, you have to check. It could be Confucianism or Taoist. Because, like, Confucianism is pretty influential. Prior to um, the atheist uh, phase, nationalizing the nationalistic atheism that takes uh, place in China. Mm. Aoi kutsu? Aoi. Aoi. Kutsu. Wait. Aoi kutsu? What? Oh, oh, kutsu. <laughs> Mm. I like baking cakes. Especially for birthdays. Or their birthday is coming up. Anyways. They're a very nice person. And they like cakes. They like making cakes. Baking cakes. It's good you must. Sikhism, okay, yep, Taoism, Confucianism, and Shinto. This plan for the week, yep. Yeah, um, I'm always curious how we, how, um, people spell Taoism versus Taoism. So I have always, you know, I haven't looked up why it's, it's always flexing between D and T's. Can, um, maybe... I know this would be a weird question to ask, but I would probably be curious in asking that question <laughs> to your religion professor. Like, wait, wait, why do people flex between Taoist and Taoist? It's referring to the same thing, but still kind of a weird thought. A language related thought. Okay. Uh, Oishi. Oh yeah, in Shintoism, there's a lot of things that deal with uh, the language. So when you're learning Japanese, there's quite a lot of things that are um, that deals with Shintoism. So it's pretty interesting. You can probably find like an elevated interest because you're studying Japanese. <laughs> 